Good evening. My name is Mark Syme, Minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I'd like to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, October the 13th. We will sing several songs. We will observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message for you that I hope will be beneficial and uh, enlightening to you. Here in Northfield, we sing from the songbook entitled Songs of Faith and Praise, and so I will give you the number of the song and the title. Uh, if you do not have that book, but if you're quick on your finger with the Google or if you have another book, uh, you can hopefully sing along with us. The first song that we will sing is number 296. 296, the title of the song is, We Have Come Into His House. 296, We Have Come Into His House. <clears throat> we have come into His house and gathered in His name to worship Him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. We will now sing number 183. 183, Lord of all being, throned afar. 183, Lord of all being, throned afar. <clears throat> Lord of all being throned afar, thy glory flames from sun and star, center and hope of every sphere, yet to each loving heart our near. Son of our life, thy quickening ray sheds on our path the glow of day. Star of our hope, thy softened light cheers the long watches of the night. Our midnight is thy smile withdrawn. Our noontide is thy gracious dawn. Our rainbow arch thy mercy sign. All save the clouds of sin are thine. Before we sing the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 364, Come Share the Lord. 364, Come Share the Lord. <clears throat> We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. 
Come share the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here. We in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. One see he meets us here. In the breaking of the bread, we'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of the Lord, our coming King, the one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. This is the part of our service when we observe the Lord's Supper. We were told to do this uh, in Acts, the 20th chapter, in verse 7, where when Paul was preaching at Troas, he gathered uh, the people together and he said on the first day of the week, they gathered together to break bread. It's a very significant verse because it says, and to me, it very powerfully implies that on every first day of the week, we are to break bread. That means we are to partake of the Lord's Supper, which he instituted in the night in which he was betrayed. When he gathered about the table, he told them to take bread, this is my body, Take the cup. This is my blood. Paul uh, reiterated that in the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. Almost word for word what Jesus had said. And so as we gather about the table, we do it in recognition that this is what we are commanded to do. We are commanded to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for all mankind that he physically gave himself up. He allowed himself to be hung on the cruel cross of Calvary, nails driven into his hands and his feet, blood flowing from his body, that we might have a new covenant in him, in the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, so grateful in your divine wisdom that at just the right time you sent Jesus to us. We are so blessed. We are so blessed that he was the master teacher. We are so blessed that he was part divine and part human. He was the son of God and the son of man. And as we take of this bread, we remember his body that was tortured on the cross as he sacrificed himself for the sins of the world. Be with us as we partake of this emblem. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. Blood is that life-giving fluid that flows through our body. When it no longer flows through our body, we cannot live. Let's pray for the cup. We're so grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood, that blood which is for us our salvation. 
It is the blood that washes away our sins. It is the blood that atones for our sins and forgives our sins. So as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we remember the blood that Jesus shed for each one of us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper, we are also instructed on the first day of the week to lay by in store. We are supposed to lay by in store that which we have prospered and give it back to the Lord. It's not a cavalier thing to do. It's something that uh, the, the scriptures say that uh, we are supposed to think about. We're supposed to think of how we have been blessed. Being blessed is not reaching into our pocket for a couple of coins and throwing them into the plate. Being blessed is purposeful giving. It's planned giving. It's giving as we have prospered so that the Lord's work can be continued. And so as we think of this giving, uh, help us to be the type of cheerful givers that uh, God wants us to be. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we not only have the opportunity to give, but that we have the desire to give. Help us as we give back to you and help those that uh, are in charge of these monies, that they will be used to further your work, that they will be used to bring others to the Lord, that they will be used to help those that are in need. Bless us in our giving. Help us to be cheerful givers. Help us to be purposeful givers. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we will sing is number 681. It's one of my favorite songs. It's called More Holiness Give Me. 681. There are several attributes here in this song that I believe are so important to us as Christians and as we walk down our Christian walk, that uh, we walk in a way that we reflect the holiness of Jesus Christ in our lives. 681, more holiness give me. <clears throat> more holiness give me, more strivings within. More patience in suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense of His care, more joy in His service, more purpose in prayer. More gratitude give me, more trust in the Lord, more pride in His glory, more hope in His word, more tears for His sorrows, more pain at His grief. More meekness and trial, more praise for relief, more purity give me, more strength to overcome, more freedom from earth stains, more longing for home. More fit for the kingdom, more useful I'd be, more blessed and holy, more Savior like thee. I hope you enjoyed 
singing praises to the Lord. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. Uh, those of you that know me know that uh, I probably don't have the best singing voice on the planet, but I do love to sing praises of my Lord. As you know, we've been doing a series on Sunday evening. Uh, the main title of the series has been The Way of Christ. Okay, The Way of Christ and some of the things that are involved in the way of the Christ. Um, we've talked about the way of Christ being the way to God, the way to life, truth, love, joy, peace, unity, prayer, and forgiveness. I've listed them all. This evening, we are going to talk about the way of bearing fruit that we are to be fruit-bearing Christians. Now, many of you are familiar with the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, I've always called it the I am the vine chapter because Jesus very succinctly describes the relationship between God, him, and man. And uh, God is the tree. The vine is Jesus Christ. The branches are you and I. And Jesus described this as a mark of discipleship. And with it, in this wonderful chapter, Jesus' disciples are called upon to bear fruit. And again, he's very exact and very succinct when he talks about what happens to the disciples that do not bear fruit. And so, uh, uh, fruit bearing is such an important part of the Christian life. And with that in mind, let's talk about fruit bearing for a few minutes this evening. Bearing fruit contingent on abiding in Christ. Now, be quick to understand this. Jesus explained it to us. In John 15 and verse 4, it says that we must abide in him, as the branch cannot bear fruit in of itself. And so if we are be, to be fruit-bearing, as the way to Christ and the way of Christ, we are to be connected and bear much fruit by abiding in him. This is acknowledged by the Apostle Paul when he says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the same vine tree branch principle. I, you and I, can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And this confidence that we have uh, is reflected in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, that we have an adequacy about us that comes through Jesus Christ. With that in mind, it seems as that if, if the tenor of this lesson has come across correctly, we might ask ourselves the question, how can we abide in Christ? Well, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, gives us the genesis of this. It says, first, we do this by putting him on in baptism. And when that happens, we must abide in love. We need to, as again in the I am the vine chapter, uh, verses 9 and 10, that we are to keep his commandments. When we keep his commandments, we are the branches that God wants us to be. We are the branches that now have the capability of bearing fruit. 
And with that in mind, we might ask ourselves the question, well, just how much fruit am I supposed to bear? Uh, I might <laughs> remind you, a few years ago, a church brother gave me a small fig plant and I planted it and I didn't take care of it very well. I left it out through the winter and I was sure that it had died. And come springtime, it was just looking dead and all of a sudden leaves started to sprout out of it. And I realized that this was a hardy tree. And uh, it is now about five years later. And if I look in my backyard right near my deck, it is a tree that is seven or eight feet tall. In the course of the last, oh, three or four weeks, me, Mark Syme, have devoured a lot of wonderful tasting figs. This fig tree has borne fruit. Now, I haven't fertilized it very much, but I've seen to it that it uh, has gotten a lot of water. It is now deeply rooted in the ground. It's like a tree, and that's what it is. And we understand that uh, this tree is doing what it's supposed to do. It's bearing fruit. It is abiding in all the laws of botany. All right, uh, it's rooted. It pulls up nutrients out of the soil and water. Its leaves carry on photosynthesis. And with that, this is a fig tree that is designed to bear fruit. And so with that in mind, what kind of fruit will disciples bear? Well, fruit bearing is manifested in many ways. One way is to win souls. When the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, he told them in Romans chapter 1, verse 13, that he had this great desire to go to Rome. Do you think he wanted to see the fountains? Okay, do you, do you think he was interested in some of the relics there in Rome? No. He was interested in preaching the word. He was interested in creating more disciples. Jesus set the bar for us in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 and in Mark chapter 16, where it said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And it talked about the, the fate of those that believe and that those that not believe. What was he telling his disciples, ergo, and telling us? He was telling us to bear fruit. We can bear fruit by sharing with those that are in need. Uh, we know that in the first century, uh, the church grew so rapidly because people were willing to share with one another. And it was, it was evidenced in God's word when people shared with each other. They became better. And I would contend this evening that one of the ways that we can bear fruit is by sharing with one another. In some cases, sharing the word of God with one another. We can do that so much better when as Christians, we develop Christ-like characteristics, indicating, as it says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 15, and then verse 22 and 23, that we are walking in the Spirit, and we want to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, which Peter so eloquently puts forth in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. A few moments ago, we praised God in song. We are instructed to do that. 
the fruit of our lips and prayer, our spiritual sacrifice. That's what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. And how often are we supposed to do that? Read the scripture. It says we are supposed to do that continually. And last on my list of fruit bearing is, what does fruit bearing lead to for you and I as Christians? Well, first, I would contend that it leads to joy. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, and by the way, Paul loved the church at Thessalonica. He praised them because there was true joy in them because they were willing to share. And uh, John reflected that in 3 John uh, 1, uh, verse 4, where it talked about his children. And his he was so glad that, and he looked at these people as his children were following in the footsteps of Jesus. Sharing with others produces happiness. And Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it says, those who give are blessed. If Christians are so materialistic and selfish that they do not share, they'll ne never know the blessedness of giving, and that part of fruit bearing will be absent from their life. We are instructed to be like Jesus Christ. He set the bar for us. We are supposed to desire to have Christ-like characteristics. Again, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, Peter tells us about knowledge and what gets added on to knowledge. And why? Well, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate answer to that is that we may have an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of the world as we do what we're supposed to do in the kingdom of God here on earth, the church. Um, when we fruit bear, when we develop this Christ-like uh, love, it gives us assurance of our salvation because we are told to be fruit bearers. This is what John 15 lets us know. We, if we want to have that assurance, must be sure that we bear fruit. And lastly, we bear fruit by praising our God. Why? Because he's our God and he deserves our prayer. We praise God and we pray. And uh, a couple of my favorite verses are found in Philippians, the fourth chapter, where he says, be anxious in nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known of God. This is both praise and prayer. And then in verse 7, it gives us the ultimate uh, result because it says the peace that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds. If we're not fruit bearers, we can't apply Philippians chapter 6 and verse 7 to our lives. And so we, we complete this lesson this evening. The way of bearing fruit is essential to the way of Christ. It's necessary to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, to be a fulfilled disciple of Jesus Christ, to truly know the way of Jesus Christ is to abide in him and to keep his commandments. Produce fruit that glorifies the Father. Let's sum this up by going back to the 15th chapter 
of the book of John, where in verse 8 it says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. Those are powerful words. If we want to be true disciples of the Lord, we will bear fruit for him. We will live the godly lives and show the Christ-like character that we're supposed to take on when we come to the Lord. And with that, we offer the invitation this evening. If you've not started your Christian walk, you haven't begun bearing fruit yet. You haven't begun bearing fruit for the Lord. The Christian fruit that comes from bringing others to Christ, to helping those that are in need by sharing both the word of God and sharing what we have with other people. Uh, this happens when we become God's children through Jesus Christ. It comes when we receive uh, and read his Holy Spirit inspired word. And by believing it, we know what we have to do next because the words are in there. It says we have to tell the Lord we're sorry for the lives that we've lived and we don't want to be those people anymore. We want to be fruit bearing people. And we know we can only be fruit bearing people by having Christ in our lives. So we confess Christ as the son of God and complete this. We show the Lord how much we love him by being baptized for the remission of our sins that we may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so if you're in listening range this evening and you need to come to the Lord, get in touch with one of us. We'll be willing to help you in any way that we can. Let's close with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the time that we've had together. We know that the uh, lesson this evening is talking about the way of Christ and that the way of Christ is the way of bearing fruit. Help us to be fruit bearers for you, dear God. Help us in our lives to exemplify Christ-like characteristics. Help us to be what we are to be, godly and righteous people. And in that, we have the hope of eternal salvation. We have the hope of eternal salvation because we have abided in God, the tree, through Jesus, the vine. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we walk on our Christian walk. Help us to do so in a way that you would be proud of us, that we would exemplify what being a Christian is all about. Can you continue to bless us, comfort us when we need comforting. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all.